And yep. So, floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, very happy to be here. Everyone, nice to meet you. I haven't met you yet. Um, my name is Gabriel Lanky. Uh, I am currently an assistant professor at the University of Rochester in New York State. And I want to tell you a little bit about some of the things that I've been thinking about in recent years um, and some of the topics that I, I personally feel are you know, worth discussing and thinking about. Um, so, one, of, one thing that is very special about thermodynamics is that most of the quantities that we're interested in are, are not really functions of state, uh, like you know, some property of a state psi or a density matrix row, but instead they are they are the outcome of transformation, right? So things like heat and work, they depend on changes of state, right? On, on how things transform from before and after, right? And there is um there's something kind of foundational about that because how do we access something that depends on a transformation, right? So if you think about it, you know, we have to say, you know, that change in energy, how do we access that? Well, we have to measure it. We have to measure it twice, at least, right? It's a delta, so we measure before and we measure after. And this has been a paradigm within the quantum thermodynamics field for uh, around 15 years, at least, with this idea of what we call two-point measures. That started in 2007. Um, um, and the basic idea is that if you have some kind of quantum process, so imagine, um, you know, generically a process where you have whatever system, doesn't matter what it is, some density matrix rho, and it changes to some new density matrix, rho prime is u, rho u dagger, where u is some unitary, right? And now you want to measure the change of some observer, some energy, some occupation number, or something like this, right? Uh, how do you do it? Uh, well, the basic idea is that you have to measure the system before you apply the unitary and then afterwards, right? So, so let's imagine that we have um, we have some observable A. And we want to measure the change of A. So A could be, say, a, a number of particles in your system or, or in some sub set of your system or some energy or something like this. We'll, we'll give uh, some concrete uh, examples to it. So how do we measure the change in A? I don't want to measure A. I want to measure the change in A, right? So naively, based on what we learned in quantum mechanics courses, we would say that the average change in A should be um, trace of A times U rho U dagger minus the trace of a row, All right? I mean, that's what we think because this is the average of a, the initial state is the average of a in the final state. And so this is what we should expect for the average of a. So now let's think about it. What does this even mean? I mean, what, what does this quantity actually mean, right? How would we do an experiment that would actually give you this quantity? I mean, of course you can always say, well, let's just do full state tomography. We do full tomography of the initial state, and then we reconstruct this object. We do full tomography of the final state, we reconstruct this object, and then we're done. We get delta A. It's fine. It's true. It's not really you know, a measurement of this quantity, right? I mean, how do we do an experiment that actually access this object? Because, see, I mean, and this I think resonates a little bit with some of the questions that were asked today. We, we live in a single shot world, right? We do experiments in a single shot way. We we measure, we get some random outcomes, and from these outcomes, we're going to be able to reconstruct these objects. Yeah? So when you say single shot, like, um, like what's the I'm coming from quantum engineering uh, background, and when we make measurements, we, we get these strings. Yeah. From one shot, actually, we get these strings, and then we have to actually repeat it like hundreds of times so that we can get back to meaningful statistics from it. Do you mean something like this when you make a measurement here, or do you really mean this single one? Yeah, sorry, maybe uh, I, I mean the first one. So, definitely, I mean, of course, in the end of the day, you do need to do repetitions of the experiment. But uh, the, the first example that I mentioned would be two separate experiments. In one experiment, I measure this quantity. In the second experiment, I 
I first prepare my state for prime and then measure this quantity. What I mean by single shot is I want to do two measurements in a row, right? one and then the other. Right? So it's, there's still going to be an ensemble repetition, but it's an ensemble repetition of two point measures. Is that a, yeah? Okay, so let's, let's essentially try to do that because I think this is a basic calculation uh, and if this is too dull, I apologize, but I do think that this touches on some meaningful uh, um, uh, issues that we run in, uh, in the field very often. So I wanna do, try to do an experiment where we measure this thing. And this is what people call the two point measurement scheme. You know, it's been really uh, popped all over quantum thermodynamics in, in many different contexts. And so here's what I want to do. I have an observable A. Maybe I will say that this A has some eigenvalues A and eigenvectors A. And I want to measure this observable. So I'm going to do for simplicity projective measurement on this basis A. Okay. So I start with my initial state. And so before I apply my unitary, I measure A. So I measure the basis A. And what I'm going to but again, it's just a single random number, right? Again, just just a, a bit, just a number, a, right? Uh, if this and this number it occurs with probability p a, which is a rho a, and if, if this is indeed you know at least according to the postulates of quantum mechanics, if we do observe us from a, we must update our state from rho to a. Okay. And now we apply our unit there. So now our state has been updated to a a, and now we apply our unitary. So the unitary is going to take us from a a to u a a u dagger, and then we measure again, right? So we measure the same basis. And now we're going to obtain the probability that we find an outcome a prime given a is going to be a u, sorry, a prime u a, a u factor a prime, which I can write more compactly as a prime u a squared. And now this is a transition probability, right? It's a probability, it's a condition, right? I observe a prime given that initially I observed a probability that the system transitioned from A to A prime. Now, the full probability of the two outcomes is going to be P of A, A prime is P of A prime A, P of A. And I want to now massage this a little bit. I want to rewrite it in a way that will turn out to be very convenient for us. So just bear with me for a second. Let's write this down very explicitly. So let me write this down as a prime u a a u dagger a prime p of a. And for reasons that will become clear in just a second, I will introduce these are projectors by A as just the butterflies A A. Okay? Yeah. You started out writing down very nicely on the back is visible, but then if you progress it's small. Too small? Okay, I will expand it again. Sorry about that. So then with this, I want to write, I already see a projector here in the middle, so now I'm going to write it a little bit bigger. U by A, U dagger, A prime, P A. Okay. And I want to also introduce a projector here, so I'm going to use a little trick, the trace of another product. Is an inner product. Okay, so I want to put this A prime like in here. And so I want to write this as A, A prime is a trace 
of phi of a prime u phi of a u dagger a. And now I want to do one final little trick. I still have this PA here and I want to play with it. <clears throat> so I'm going to define a new state. Row bar as B of sum over A, 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 row, A, A. So this is the defaced version of row. It starts in the initial state row and I deface it in the basis of the observable that, that I measure. Okay. And the advantage of this is that I can write um, this quantity here, phi a times p a. <clears throat> this is actually the same as phi a times rho bar. Where here p a is a number, here rho bar is, is an operator, right? But this is true because you know, if I just put phi a here, I'm only going to get uh, one term in this uh, expansion. And so with this, I can finally write that my probability distribution is equal to trace. Uh, maybe I can move things around a little bit. I'm going to use the cyclic property of the trace. And I'm going to put u dagger over here. And so I get this. Okay. This is the probability of joint output. The probability that I measure A, apply unitary to measure A again for the two outputs. Now, you know, this is the data that we get, right? What we get are two numbers, A and A prime. That's it. And now, and these numbers occur with this probability. So now that we have these numbers, we, we can try to see if there's some quantity that we can come up with uh, who will give us this change in observable weight. This is what we want to get to, right? This is where we start. So I'm going to define a quantity, stochastic quantity. I'm going to define a quantity q, and I'm going to call this a prime minus a. This is a random variable, right? Purely classical, nothing going on about it. And I get two random outcomes that just take their difference. I don't know why, maybe, you know, kind of makes sense that, you know, if I'm measuring observable A and little A are the eigenvalues of this observable, then somehow, you know, kind of makes sense that this should be a reasonable one for you to play with. And now I can do statistics, I can do probability theory. I can just, you know, this is a probability distribution, this is a random variable, I can compute averages and variances and whatever I want, right? So I can compute the average of Q. And this will be sum over a, a prime, a prime minus a, p of a, a prime. Okay. And so I'm going to write this down explicitly. This is going to be sum over a, a prime, a prime trace of u dagger phi a prime u phi a rho bar minus sum over a. A prime a trace of u dagger phi <coughs> a prime u phi a rho bar. I will leave this here. This. And the only reason why I wrote this very explicitly like this is because now I can just carry out the sums over A and A prime. The sum over the projectors is just the identity matrix. And the sum when I have for uh, A times phi A, this is just my original observable A. This equation is here. And so for example, if you look at this term, there will be uh, uh, the sum over A is just going to make this become an identity. Here's the sum over A prime. There's an A prime here. It's going to be the observable A. And similar to this thing on this one. And so putting everything together, I get that the expectation value of Q is equal to the trace of U dagger A U rho bar minus the trace of A 
row one. Okay. And so you see that we don't get this. Right? It's different. This is not the same in general as what we call the other. This term is actually the same because the trace of A row bar, since row bar is the state the phase is the basis of the observable. This is actually the same as trace of A row. But this is the big difference. There's a row bar here, and there there is no row bar. Right? So here we measured first, so we did phase the stage row, and then when we evolve, we get a different answer. So, so in this sense, you can you can kind of think of uh, this uh, two point measurement scheme as something that is um, okay. Maybe this is not the best word, but I like to think about it as something extrinsic, in the sense that the quantity that we're actually assessing depends on the fact that we want to assess it, right? The fact that we measure it affects the process in a way that is kind of unavoidable. So, of course, there are two uh, follow-up questions. One is, can, can we avoid this? this? This is kind of a limitation, right? It means that we want to study the change of some observable, but if we actually want to measure this, we never get delta A. We always get something else, right? Unless, of course, rho bar is the same as rho, right? And unless the state of rho is, is incoherent in the basis of A, then it, everything is fine. But if they're not, then, you know, we want to access this thing, but we can't. We access something else. Right, so can we avoid this? I don't know, but I don't think so. This is an open question, and uh, um, I don't think that this is something that can be avoided in general. This is really a limitation of the fundamental back action that is associated with two quantum measurements. The other question is what? Yeah. <laughs> Coupling to the environment. It's not necessarily the coupling to the environment. It's the fact that we're measuring a, syst a, a system. So we're measuring some observable that might be incompatible with our state preparation, right? So, so we want to measure, say, A is some kind of energy, and we prepare our system with some kind of coherence. Because we want to assess the change in that energy, our first measurement just uh, uh, destroyed that coherence. Uh, oh. So you're thinking about not doing doing two measurements about just doing a preparation and then a final measurement. Yeah, I prepare, but then I indigest, right? I know my sequence uh, it is actually like a spin polarized, right? Yeah. But then it actually contributes to the kind of and then I get this chance. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of like a measurement in a sense. Yeah, and, and I mean, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that, right? But it's not really doing uh, two measurements in a row. It's not really assessing a change in something, like a change in, in energy of a system, right? It's, it, there is a preparation step that you first do. And then you, because you prepared it in some well-defined state, you know the initial property. It's, a well it's not in a superposition of the properties that you want to measure. And then you evolve it and measure at the end. And because you knew the initial state, then you can kind of make the connection and say, well, the energy changed by this. But that's only because the initial state was prepared in a state that was not in a superposition of the thing that you want to measure, right? So there's nothing wrong with that, but it's just that it's, it's not a, exactly this, right? Yeah. Sorry. Uh, this shares maybe some similarities with quantum calibration. And because they have also some evolution on the system and you try to measure with a syndrome, so you need certainly more qubits to do this or more, more quantum systems in this, in this sense. But if, for, for a single system, I agree what you say, but if you are allowing for uh, making gates to other systems and uh, copy information to a studio and, and then measure parities on this or have a special uh, encoding there, well, I think that's, that's maybe the way out. Uh, 
Uh, that, that's interesting that you asked that. So we've played before with the idea of having multiple copies of our system. So now instead of having row, we have multiple parallel copies, and we do some funny business with the copy. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and and it's true. Sure. Uh, 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 in that case, you can you can bypass this kind of problem, right? Um, in a certain sense, I think uh, it's interesting to, to discuss what bypass the problem means. As I said, if you just want to reconstruct this quantity, just do full tomography, you're fine, right? So if all I want you to do is get this number, I don't need, I, there's plenty of ways of bypassing it, right? But are they experimentally meaningful uh, in the sense of, you know, things that would happen in the lab? When we measure heat in, a, in classical thermodynamics, we don't usually ask these questions, right? It's just something that, you know, your bucket of water heats up or, or, and we don't care about doing two-point measures. Right, so I think it's interesting to think about, you know, what does it mean to bypass something like this, and you know, and this is really, I guess, an experimental question again. Sorry, there was another question. Different point tomography, like, um, why can't we just put the time dimension with half the systems? That's also fine. Sorry, you're you're right. Yeah, yeah, it it, it just needs to measure. This is their goal. You're you're right, and then you do a repreparation or prepare the initial state, evolve, and then measure the number. You're absolutely right. More questions? Yeah. Oh, so what you said is funny is why is it going on not Sorry, why is the law not? Right, because the idea is that suppose uh the observable that you're measuring is that sigma z of a period, right? But suppose that your initial state rho is uh um has some coherences in the computational basis, right? Then the fact that your initial measurement is measuring sigma z is actually gonna kill this coherence. And so your row bar is going to be just the diagonal bar. It's going to be the decoherent version. And that's all because we want to do two measurements in a row. We want to do one and the other. That's why. So, um, well, so let's look again at this two point measurement probability distribution, right? So, uh, as I mentioned, the, the kind of the, the root of the problem is really that you end up with a row prime here, even though you wanted to start with some state row, you end up with a row, row sorry, row bar that is it, it, associated to the phasing of the first measurement. So, then you can say, well, no, I solve all my problems. I'm going to define a new probability distribution, which is just This plus, right? No problem anymore. This seems fine. In fact, if you use this probability distribution, you're going to get your average perfectly like you want it, right? So it seems like the problem is solved. Unfortunately, this is complex. It's not necessarily real, right? So this object, because rho phi a and rho is not necessarily mute, this quantity can be complex. Right? And so this is called the Kirkwood Dirac quasi probability distribution. Right? It's a quasi probability because uh, uh, it's, it adds up to one, which is great, but it, it's not necessarily real. Right? You can also say, well, okay, let's call that, right? Let's just take the real part. Right? So let's just define a new probability called the marginal view probability, which is just going to be the real part. Of the curve with zero, and this uh, it turns out you can also write as uh, one half raise u dagger by a prime u, and then here you get the anti commutator of phi a with rho. And so the anti commutator is a b plus b a. Right? And so again, you know, this field might like, solve the problem. This quantity is real, but it turns out that it can be negative, right? So it's still a positive probability. It adds up to one, which is great, but it can be negative. And there's a meaningful um, physics about negativities, right? So one can show, Nicole has done a lot of work on this, that the negativities or the complexities of these distributions may have a lot of information about quantumness of certain processes. So, you know, the quantum features of a process. Are encoded in the, exactly in the fact that these things can be denied. Be, be <laughs> There's a trick to show the negativity, 
um, which is the following. So you can write uh, with a little bit of massaging, you can actually write the marginal yield probability, quasi probability as the PPM distribution minus um, one half trace of U dagger by A prime U rho minus rho A, where rho A is phi A rho phi A plus one minus phi A rho one minus phi. Okay, so so a TPM, I just wrote a little detail, but it's this thing, right? So the marginal of probability distribution is the same as the TPM distribution minus another object, which is somehow a difference between the state row and this kind of finalized uh, uh, version of row where this is like, you know, I have no test. You, you ask if row in A or not in A. When the state is incoherent, it is either in A or not in A. Right, but when there is a superposition, it's not necessarily in A or not in A, it can be in A and not in A, and so this will be non zero. And so you get a negative thing here that's one of the arguments why this could be negative. Do you have an intuition for the negative probability value of the signifier or just the probability? So there's a bunch of formal results, and Nicole will definitely be the better person to talk about this, but there are a bunch of formal results relating negativity to certain features, uh, such as contextuality and lack of commutativity between rho and A and so on. So, so uh, I, I don't know a lot about uh, um, about this field. I just wanted to kind of showcase this and, and uh, put it out there, but uh, there are results relating this to known uh, intuitions. Okay, um, so now I want to change, and instead of talking about the average of R quantity, E of Q, I want to now talk about a little bit more about the probability, right? So the probability that we get from these uh, kinds of objects. This would be the starting point of all of the fluctuation theorem business, right? So if you want to do fluctuation theorem, this is where you start. So I'm not going to talk about fluctuation theorems here. I want to actually talk a little bit more about just the variance of this one, right? just the variance of Q. Um, so to do that, let's introduce what's called the characteristic function. So I will define this object called G of chi, which is um, the average of E to the I chi. A prime minus A, or you know, each of the other kind of x, what we call Q, right? And so this is uh, sum over A, A prime, E to the I chi, A prime minus A, raised of phi uh, of U dagger, phi A prime U, phi A rho bar. And now we can do a similar trick. We can uh, carry out the sums over A and A prime and kind of put these, uh, like the, this each the I chi A prime near this one, and this will give us some each of the I chi big A and do the same for the other one. And in the end, what we get is G of chi is equal to trace E to the I chi, oh, sorry. U dagger e to the i chi a u e to the minus i chi a rho bar. Um, and we can write this even a little bit more compactly. So, you know, I always have these sandwiches, which appear quite a few times already, like U dagger, something, something U. So this is like the Heisenberg picture version of observables, right? So I'm going to define um, A of T as U dagger 
a you I've been kind of omitting the time fee here, uh, 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 but of course there's a unitary, so there's always a, a time in here. Oh, not always. We kind of just imagine there's a time here. And I'm just going to put this kind of parenthesis T. So whenever you see T like this, it means Heisenberg H. Okay. And instead of putting in like a little H, I don't know why I like to put it. We'll see how this makes sense. And then what we get with all of this is that we can write this as an average E to the I chi A of T, E to the minus I chi A, and the average is over the same profile. This is called the characteristic function of the probability distribution. Um, um, and one, one important thing that you is it, is it what you notice is that it's, it's naturally a time ordered quantity, right? So if you have you know time here, time p here, and time zero here, so there's a natural time ordering. What is useful about the characteristic function is, is that it gives you a trick to compute uh, uh, higher order moments, right? So if you want to compute the variance or other moments of Q, uh, this gives us a systematic way of doing it. Uh, the average of any moment Q to the N is minus I del chi to the N G of chi evaluated at chi equals zero. Okay. So you take the derivative with respect to chi uh, and then you set the chi to zero. Uh, this, this chi it usually goes by the name of counting field. That's the name that appears in uh, full counting statistics. Uh, sometimes I refer to this chi as a counting field, but you can just think about it as an auxiliary variable. And so now we can just try to see what happens if I do a series expansion here to get the average. Uh, so I can write this g of chi, and I can expand my exponential, right? So this is uh, expand this, expand this. I'm going to get one plus i chi average of a of t minus a rho bar, and then there's going to be a term which is proportional to chi squared over two. And this term will read a of t squared plus a squared minus two a of t a, which I'll leave for you to check. It's just expand this, expand this, and multiply our children. Um, and so, if we want to compute the second moment, uh, uh, we just need to take the second derivative, and so it's going to be a, just just whatever is in here, right? So the second moment of Q e to the Q squared is going to be the average of a of t squared plus a squared minus a of t sorry two a of t times a, right? And the first thing I wanted to comment about this, sorry, all the averages are always with respect to the state for bar. I mean, it's clear. What I wanted to comment about this is that this is not the same as the average of a of t minus a squared, okay? So uh, the first paper that introduced the two-point measurements had a catchy title, all the work is not observable, and here you know we're talking about a little bit more generally. But uh, um, the basic idea remains. You see that you know even though the average of Q, you can think about it as the average of this observable a of t minus a. This kind of suggests that a of t minus a could be thought of as uh, a change observable of a. Uh, it's not true because if you look at the higher order moments. This is not the same thing. The reason being that A of T does not necessarily commute with A, and that's why uh, uh, if you expand this out, you're not going to get the same results, right? So um, the average of Q squared is really a time ordered thing. There's always T uh, to the left and no and T equals zero to the right. Uh, whereas uh, an operator like this, if you go to squares, it wouldn't be time. So the whole point is that we can't really think about the skew. Uh, remember, you know, I define this. Company. Q as just this random variable. We cannot think about this as some 
uh, uh, mechanical observer, right? That, that you know, either the value of that is of an observer. They're not. Okay. <laughs> Questions? So what I'm going to talk about quite a bit, um, also today, but also uh, next time, is going to be the variance of Q, right? So let me just write it down so we have it here registered. So the variance of Q is uh, the average, that is the expectation value of Q squared minus the expectation value of Q squared. And so let me just write this down. So this is the average of A of p squared minus the average of a of p squared plus the average of a squared minus the average of a squared minus two times the average of a of p a minus the average of a of p average of okay so I think looking at these formulas is, is, is important because, um, and this will appear uh, over and over again, the variance of Q is, is, that, is an absolutely random quantity, right? I obtain outcomes A and A prime and just look at the fluctuations of this thing, right? And that's why I'm being a little bit careful just to write this, this little expectation value, just to emphasize that it's a classical thing. The things on the right here, or, or this part, they're quantum mechanical expectation values. Right, so this is the average of the Heisenberg picture version of operators and so on. And this is something that appears quite often. We're essentially mapping um, some classical thing, which is what we would observe if we did this protocol in the lab with quantum mechanical observances. And they're never as clean as we would like them to be. There's always a subtle piece. In this case, there's a subtle thing of time ordering and so on. Right, so there's always these things to be mindful of that this is a quantum mechanical observable. Uh, but the thing that we actually measure is maybe not necessarily what we hope it would be. Oh, and by the way, I forgot to say. Um, for the lack of a better name, if I have to refer to this quantity Q, I'm going to think about it as a charge. That's the name that I usually think about it. I usually, what I have in mind is, for example, suppose to have a, your system here is a, a system that has multiple parts, like, you know, a system and a bath, and you measure the number of particles in a bath, for example, then uh, 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 this would be the initial number of particles in the bath, this would be the final number of particles. So this is how much the number of particles changed in the bath. Of course, it doesn't have to be like this. It could be whatever energy you want, and so on. We'll look at more examples of that. But if, I will always think about it as some kind of charge. Right? Sorry. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I mean, I, I just wanted to say uh, I ask the expectation value is always one thing with respect to the other thing. I probably, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, in, in fact, it's interesting that, you know, within this context, really the original state plays absolutely no role. Right? Doesn't even I mean, it, it, it doesn't appear at all. Like the initial state is always going to be the same if you do this point. Okay, let me now to finish for today. I have until I guess six thirty or six six thirty. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So let me finish by talking about explanation with uh, quantum metrology. So let's um, just try to think a little bit about the relevance of a variance like this. So I can give you two examples. Suppose that what you're doing is some kind of process involving, say, a thermal machine, something like this. And suppose that this Q is the work that you can extract from, right? It's the change in energy that you extract from this work. Then variance of Q is how much the work fluctuates, right? And this, I mean, for one, I mean, Going to make, make a machine that your work fluctuates quite a lot. That's probably not a very good thing. You kind of want it to be stable. But you know, characterizing the fluctuations 
of something like work is meaningful if your work uh, fluctuations are significant, which we know they are in the microscopic domain. So this is maybe one argument as to why the variance is uh, a meaningful quantity. Another argument would be if you want to actually use this quantity to find something about your system as a sensor, as a, you know, as a metrology thing. Because there are some parameters that you want to estimate, maybe something in the unitary here, maybe something in the initial stage, you want to estimate that parameter, and you do a two-point measurement, you measure this thing, right? And now you want to build an estimator that is going to give you a guess about this parameter based on what you measure, right? And then the variance is going to give you a measure of precision, right? It's a it's technically the precision with which you can estimate this here. So let's let's take this uh, a sensing um, idea a little bit further. So suppose you know I get my data. It's two numbers, a and a prime, right? And now uh, there is some parameter theta that in, is encoded in the distribution. So my two-point measurement distribution is going to have some parameter theta encoded in it. And we'll not have to talk about this uh, for now. Just imagine that you know maybe there's some coupling constant of some direction or some uh, 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 temperature in the initial state that you want to thermometry, something like this, whatever parameter you want to estimate theta, right? And so what you want to build is uh, an estimator I'm going to call it theta hat of a a prime, which can be any function of your outcomes. Right? And you want this function to give you a guess about the uh, quantity that you're trying to estimate. Now, um, one can show uh, um, there is this bound called the femoral bound. Which says that the variance of this estimator has to be larger or equal than the derivative of the average. Divided by a quantity called the Fisher information. <clears throat> Where the Fisher information, I'm going to write it down here, is the derivative of the distribution. With respect to the parameter, it's this kind of funny combination, right? It's the derivative of the distribution squared divided by, by the distribution, right? So the Fisher information is a measure of how much information about data is encoded in your distribution. So how much we know about data uh, uh, from data about this distribution. And so um, you see that if the estimator is unbiased, And bias means that the average of theta hat is theta. So the average of your estimator is the real parameter that you're trying to estimate. Then this derivative is trivial, this gives you the number one. And so get the deficient information, the variance is largely equal to the deficient information. So the, uh, you can also think about the deficient information as the, uh, uh, it's one over the variance, right? So big deficient information is good. You want to have big deficient information, meaning you would have very small variance. If you know uh, your estimator. Yeah? Is that not an operator on the bottom space? Or? No, sorry. Theta is, is a, a, a parameter, right? So, so uh, uh, for example, you could have a Hamiltonian that is a theta sigma z. Okay, so, theta is some frequency that is, right? Is that uh, just a parameter that you want to estimate? Is that Sorry, th yeah, theta head is, is an estimator. So it's still a, it's not an operator, never an operator, but it's a function of your, your random data. Sorry, yeah, the, the head is kind of ambiguous here. I apologize for that. Uh, it's just a, a random variable, right? So A and A prime are random, theta head is random, right? And so the average of theta head, this, this is all classic. There's absolutely nothing important to do about theta. Yeah. Now, as I mentioned, my data is the two bits A and A prime. I could imagine uh, using estimators, which are uh, um, just my charge Q, right? So I can use 
Q is A prime minus A as an estimator. And this will then give me a bound, then the variance of Q must be larger or equal than the derivative of the average of Q with respect to theta divided by F of theta. So this kind of bound is actually a family of bounds because I didn't really say what theta was, right? And, and variance of Q is, is uh, uh, quite general. So this is true for any parameter that appears in my model, anything that would appear in your unit theory, anything, this is always true. So, so you can think about this as a family of bounds. And this has been quite used uh, in the in recent years just as a tool for understanding the fluctuation. So this gives you uh, a, a lower bound on how much your charge can fluctuate associated to some measure of pressure pressure. So now I want to show a very concrete example of how this can be used. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so are any time crystal settings to measurements kind of estimated? Yeah, yeah. So if you just look at the thousand of them, would that be very small or need to have a few times? Sorry, yeah, uh, I need to be a bit more precise. So suppose you do any repetitions of it, it, this two-point measurement, then there would be a little end. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it, of course, you can, yeah, yeah. You, you, in principle, we could put a little end here, but we kind of don't have to. You can think about this as this a very single repetition. Uh, this is that many if you want. Because there have to be independent repetitions. Okay, so to finish, let me do one example of uh, how this has been used uh, to give something interesting. Suppose I have my unitary. So suppose the unitary, you know, it was initially like this. So there was some Hamiltonian, it's really time dependent Hamiltonian, right? So this was my initial unitary. But suppose that I do a small deformation of the unitary. Suppose I change this to what I'm going to call u theta, which is e to the minus i h t, one plus theta. Right? So this would be a, a, a time dilation. Essentially, you know, I'm taking every constant that appears in my Hamiltonian and I dilating by one plus theta, right? Now I can ask about the Fisher information of this quantity. The Fisher information of this quantity is gonna turn out to be related to, uh, you know, estimating time, essentially estimating our ability to, you know, impose time in our system. So we'll see how this comes about. Um, in the end, I want to compute the Fisher information when theta is zero. So I imagine that I do kind of an infinitesimal dilation of time, and then I, I set this theta to zero, okay? So um, let's see what I get. So the average of Q, I need two ingredients, right? To play with this, I need two ingredients. I need the Fisher information and I need uh, the derivative with respect to theta of the average of Q. So the average of Q is uh, the average of e to the minus i uh, plus i h t. One plus theta a e to the minus i h t one plus theta. That's uh, what we call it a of t minus the average of a. Again, everything with respect to little bar. And I need to do the derivative of this with respect to uh, the parameter theta. So I do del theta e of theta. And what I get is, uh, if I differentiate things here, it's going to be an i, and I get uh, average of h uh, u dagger a u um, minus i average u dagger a u dagger a u dagger. Okay. Again, sorry, everything is with respect to Omar. I'm going to forget that. <laughs> but, um, and now this kind of looks a little bit weird, but um, if you think about it for a second, this is really, I mean, this is actually the derivative of A of T, e, 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 right? Because from a Heisenberg equation, 
This is H commuting with the Heisenberg picture operator, right? So this is H A of T minus A of T H with an I. So this is really the derivative of the operator. So this is like a curve, right? So we're actually going to call this. Um, um, oh, sorry, there, there was a little uh, factor of T here. This is T times. So this is T times what I'm going to call a current, I am T. The term current here is a little bit ill defined. Uh, um, just because, uh, I mean, I'm just doing a two point measurement scheme, right? It's only two measurements. It's not a continuous measurement, but there's continuous current flowing, there, flowing through. Uh, but uh, it's just a current because this is the derivative of, uh, it's the rate of change of this, right? It's just the rate of change of E of T. And lastly, I need to compute also the Fisher information. And so since I'm running out of time, I'm just going to write you the formula. It turns out that the Fisher information can be written as t squared times the average of a quantity that I call w squared, where this w is the following quantity of the quantity. Okay. Which is, uh, I mean, this is called a weak value, right? So this is the weak value of the Hamiltonian with respect to two states here, A and U, uh, A prime, right? Um, so um, at this point, it's not very intuitive what this means, okay? Um, but you can actually write this down, and I find this quite interesting. You can write this down as the rate of change of the log of u a prime a of t squared, where u a prime a is the a prime u a. So the Fisher information turns out to be the variance of the rate of change of these matrix elements, right? Uh, and so this is, as I mentioned, is related to this idea that uh, we're essentially measuring our ability to do timekeeping, right? To, to impose time into the process. And so somehow the fish information is the fluctuations actually of uh, 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 how much time is encoded in these matrix elements. For, for the fish, right? And then combining everything, finally, we get a bound, which is that this will be the current squared divided by uh, uh, the expectation value of the A prime squared. And this bound in the literature goes by the name of a, a kinetic uncertainty relation. Uh, even though this name was coined in classical stochastic processes, people have been working on this in quantum processes recently. Uh, it's essentially bound on the signal to noise ratio. This is how much our observable, uh, uh, our, sorry, our charge fluctuates. This is, you know, the, the, essentially the rate of change of the charge. And this is a uh, quantity related to uh, our ability, ability to do time. Right? Um, yes. Uh, yeah, and I forgot to say uh, this fish information is also sometimes called this dynamical activity, quantum dynamical activity, because it somehow measures activity, measures you know, how things are happening. Right? Uh, yeah. Okay, and I think that's it. I'm going to stop here and then we take our time. Yeah. Well, so I was wondering when um, you were using theta as a parameter, I said to myself, okay, that's it's not an observable, so they're they're doing an observable relation, but then you you switched in the Q for an observable and it goes as one over n. So if you're squeezing the uncertainty to in principle for a large number n. It's to zero. It, are there consequences for the squeezing of, of let's say, a non-commuting observable with Q? 
and violating the Heisenberg inversion. So, so Q is not an observable, right? Oh, I thought you said it was. No, no, it, it is. It is a, a random variable, right? It's just it, it, it's just the uh, um, the thing that you get from doing the two-point measurement scheme, right? You get one bit, bit of data A, another bit of data A prime. You just take their difference, and so it's not a quantum mechanical observable. I mean, part of this game is to relate these practical things to quantum mechanical observables, but the object itself is not a quantum mechanical observable. So this is not a quantum mechanical variance. It's just a probabilistic variance in the standard sense. So I, don't, I hope does that answer your question? But A prime and A are So they are the eigenvalues of an observer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're, they're uh, real numbers. Yeah. Will there be some capacity for running into trouble if, for example, you are saying that Q is charged and you're in, and theoretically you could collect this charge in a capacitor like, and then have this being measured directly. Right. So, I mean, first of all, maybe the name charge is a little bit ill defined. It's just, you know, yeah, already... I mean that that's similar, similar to how you can measure how you can have current and you can connect it to charge that's collected somewhere over time. You, well, I suppose you could, could do the same for any kind of, well, for, maybe, maybe not for any, but for many kind of two point measurements where, where in the end it, it classically should be related to an observable. Right, right. And you're absolutely right. Yeah. So uh, um, uh, you run into trouble if you want to have coherent superpositions of uh, eigenstates of the thing that you're trying to measure. And, and of course, what I mean by run into trouble is just that you deface whatever. Coherent superpositions that you have, but very often, you know, when you should be working with situations that don't have coherent superpositions, then the common situation is when you have, for instance, a system coupled to a bat, and the charge that you're measuring is the charge in the bat, and then you don't care about coherence in the bat, and that part is irrelevant. All you care about is co uh, are quantum phenomena happening in the system, and then in that case, you, you're free to measure the charge in the bat. Does that help? And then this would be the, the change in charge, right? So it's like, of course, in reality, we don't do this. If you have a capacitor, you don't measure how many electrons are in there, right? But uh, this would be, you know, you measure one, then you have 10 to the 26 electrons, then you have, you know, one well, point two. used to do it when they wanted to measure low currents a long time ago. Right. Instead but, of measuring currents, they collected it over a long time and then quickly discharged the capacitor one and measured the current that they could actually measure. Right. What I meant is, you know, there is also other charges in the capacitor from whatever atoms you have in there, and of course you don't measure those, right? So you might, usually what we do in practice is measure changes of phase, right? You measure how much charge entered the capacitor versus how much it was like, you know, you, you set up a ground for a capacitor and then you measure the change. But in any case, I think that's not a problem for the argument in the sense that, yeah, I mean, if you want to measure two things and measure, you know, charge on some system, that's absolutely fine. Right. Uh, 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 the only problem is that you know coherent superposition will be destroyed by. Okay, I'll finish the talk. Fantastic delivery. So join me in thanking. Uh... Yeah, we are.